May my words, our thoughts, and our lives be a blessing to others and a delight in your heart, O oh Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen. For about two months, I have been working my way through hell. Uh, that is, I have been rereading with a group of colleagues Dante's Inferno, which is the first book, as you may remember, of a three-part series uh, that is called The Divine Comedy. And since I've been to hell every week, I reread the Beatitudes and I wondered, what would be the devil's edition? What if you turn the Beatitudes upside down, inside out, and saw it from hell's perspective? Well, here goes. Happy are the rich in real estate and portfolio, because they will get all the good stuff on earth. Happy are those who have never suffered any loss because they deserve all the luck and they know it. Happy are the arrogant and presumptuous because they trample all over the meek and gentle and they also enjoy exotic long vacations in remote exclusive places. Happy are they who couldn't less about justice and good deeds because they'll end with all the power chortling. Happy are those who take full revenge because they'll have the satisfaction of grinding their enemies' faces. Happy are the sardonic and worldly because they will enjoy sneering at God and everyone else. Happy are the warmongers and the sowers of chaos in families and communities because they will win and be remembered as statues. Happy are those who keep others down and torment them for the fun of it because they will have the delights of the cruel and they will be great in hell. Are you appalled at my evil edition of the Beatitudes? Turned on their heads, they sound frighteningly contemporary. Contemporary. Read the newspapers. A lot of people believe some version of my devil's edition. And maybe, if you're completely honest, one or two of this edition lurk, at least half alive, in the back of the closet of your mind. Hmm? Money, luck, power, yeah, that's how you win. God forbid. Now, going back, much as I like peacemakers, and I was always willing that the righteous uh, be blessed and uh, all the other good things, I always particularly disliked the beatitude about the meek. I don't know how you feel about the meek, but I've never liked that term. I knew early that I was not meek, and I didn't want to be. I don't care whether it means gentle, as some translations now have it, or merely meek and unassuming. When I was in high school, I had to read and then discovered it was a wonderful book, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and I loved that. 
But when I started trying some of Austin's other novels, I eventually got to Mansfield Park. I don't know if you've ever read it, but I disliked it. It's meek, heroine, Fanny Price, I absolutely disliked and scorned. She was always self-effacing. Yeah. And then, 20 years later, I read Mansfield Park again and discovered what my younger, arrogant self never noticed. The enormous courage and strength of character it took Fanny to be gentle and moral around the immoral and self-confident who were pushing her around to do things that she would not do because she knew they were wrong. If you've ever been in that situation in work, you know it takes courage and especially to do it with gentleness. Now, you may not be a Jane Austen fan, but I do want to ask you to think seriously about what constitutes a deeply good life and what does give real happiness to yourself and to others in a world that is wrenched between goodness and self-serving indifference and cruelty, whether conscious or clueless. Which edition of the Beatitudes, that of our Lord Jesus, or my devilish one, do you prefer to follow? St. John says that we don't yet appear to be what we are already are, beloved children of God. But then, a little further on, he adds that because we're beloved children of God, we purify ourselves because God is pure. I want to invite you to think that that is a spiritual reality. And we have seen it at a more human level. In New York City, for 60 years, they're gone now. There were a series of cafeterias called the Exchanges. The flagship one was right down Wall Street. In a more moral America, the Exchange cafeterias worked entirely on the honor system. A man, and of course mostly men, went through and picked up whatever he wanted for lunch, went to a counter, ate it, and when finished, simply went to the cashier and told him what he had eaten and paid for it. And for 60 years, the exchange cafeterias made money because even cheaters liked being thought that they were better than they were. And the, they mostly paid up. I think we Christians are to remember that we're trusted to be good, not because our reputation is on the line, but because God's reputation is on the line. We copy Christ because we want to be like him. Not that we always do it perfectly, but we are copying him who loves us and continues to love us even when we're unlovable. So by the paradox of God's upside down happiness game, when we try to be good because God is already good, we often succeed. And God trusts us to grow better as we walk in his light. God does not, at your baptism, slap you on the back and say, you're on your own, kid. God gives us the spirit to come into our hearts and our lives and gives us, if we listen, those little nudges, those small pushes that we hear day after day. 
when we pray, when we find suddenly God at our elbow and the Spirit of God going, no, don't go there, go there. And furthermore, God does not leave us alone to find our moral way in the world. We're put in a community, not only our local community of our local church, but the community, the wider community of the church throughout the world. Christians around the world are praying, acting, and living out the gospel. And we are to watch and copy them. And then there's the much vaster community of those who are dead and have gone before us. We need their examples as well. When we are tempted or confused or scared, we need their prayers. I don't know who the saints are in your life. I have saints who have inspired me, who are in the calendar of the church, and who, you know, they name churches after, and they have their own holidays, St. Patrick. And I have saints that I have known, that I met in my life, who amaze me with their goodness and with their absolute delightful commitment to God and Christ. One was an archbishop. That was a surprise. One was a woman who lived in a trailer park in Leesburg, Virginia, with a dysfunctional family and a crazy husband. But walking into her trailer was like walking into the vestibule of heaven. And I've never forgotten that. Today we give thanks for saints, known and unknown, the so-called great saints and the so-called lesser and local ones, and the ones that have shaped our lives and our walk in our faith. They're all part of our community. They hold us as an invisible cloud of witness. They're rooting for you and me, and they are hoping that we will as it were, live with honor, pay our bills well, and live according to the Beatitudes. That is the heavenly edition, not the one I tried to write, having walked through an inferno.